You know, I usually like to start these videos with some kind of fact or figure, but today is just a video of a jumping spider that has a see-through head and you can see its long eye tubes moving inside of it. Sleep tight. Now wake up, it's time for footnotes. Welcome to another edition of Because Science Footnotes, the companion show to Because Science, where I go through all of your comments, questions, and corrections, and address them behind a desk so it gives it a veneer of authority. Also, I tell you what's coming up on this week's show. Hint, I can't do legally any more of that but you know what it is. So in the last episode of Because Science, we are trying to explain the most memorable aspects of the extraterrestrial hunter known as the Predator. Anyway, they were later known as the Yaucha, and there's a lot of books written about them that I did not read. So I took the three most memorable things from the Predator movies, glowing blood, active camouflage, and infrared vision, and we try to figure out how they all work. I said that it's active camouflage is kind of like invisibility cloak technology that we are already working on, that it's infrared vision allows it to see unlike any creature we know of on Earth, although some of you have some corrections on that. We'll get to that. And I said it's blood glows because it is chemiluminescent in Earth's air. But what did you have to say? Uh, the first comment comes from frequent commenter Horrier, who says, wouldn't bioluminescent blood be counterproductive in an evolutionary sense? I mean, if you are bleeding glowing ooze, won't that make it super easy for other species to track you down? Maybe that is why predators prefer hiding and don't engage directly. Well, actually, this aspect of glowing blood, why it would be evolutionarily favored in the Yaucha, was my original idea for this video, but I didn't go with it because I didn't have a whole lot to talk about. But my basic idea was that, all right, well, if the blood could give you away very easily, how could it be evolutionarily selected for? And my idea was is that if the blood glows, it could easily signal which predator individual was the weak of the herd, so to speak. That if it was bleeding glowing blood, it would be very easy for other predators, since they value hunting prowess and strength, be very easy for other predators to find that predator that's injured and take it out of the gene pool, so to speak. I know a lot of that sounds like speculation, which is why I didn't do a full episode on it, but my through line through it was that there's uh, actually crickets that kind of do a similar thing. There's an armored katydid, or a bush cricket, that when it smells the blood of its own, they will all rush to that cricket and cannibalize it. And they even do it so much that uh, sometimes when they swarm and they cross roads, they get, they get smushed by cars, and then the cricket smell that blood, and then they go to the road, and then they get smushed. And that happens so much that it creates an insect slick on the road that is dangerous to drive on. It's like black ice, <laughs> but with way more legs. And it's gross. What was I talking about? Oh yeah, so if that's kind of a way to cull the weak from the herd, then maybe predators could do the same thing with their glowing blood. I'm just speculating. I should write some extended universe novel about it. <laughs> to be put on a bookshelf, to be never read. Our next comment comes from Stratus42, Stratus41 was taken, who says, do fireflies have butts or is it their abdomen? Well, Stratus, what maketh a butt? I would say that any section of the body that is distinguishable from the rest, like an abdomen, that also has a aperture for digested food to come out, is a butt. But if our aperture moved to a different part of our body, would you call that a butt? What if it moved to the end of my hand here? I think this would make it a butt. So yes, I think insects have butts, in so much as they excrete waste from an area on their body. Some insects do not have a butt because they do not excrete waste. It just accumulates inside themselves until they explode. Some of those are uh, face mites, and they're on your face doing what I just said right now. Actually, not a lot of comments this week, mostly corrections about one thing that you're all wrong about, so let's get to the nerdiest comment at the time I'm filming this episode, which I'm giving to James Green, who says, the best thing about looking at the predator in an evolutionary light is that you can reverse engineer the predator's home environment. First of all, 
it would be cold. As mentioned, heat vision is increasingly less useful the warmer the ambient temperature is, which means their home environment isn't overly warm by human standards. Secondly, their home world must have a significant population of endothermic or warm-blooded animals, which would be their preferred prey. Thirdly, their environment probably does not contain a great deal of natural cover, such as trees and shrubbery, incentivizing the invention of powerful and expensive camouflage. James goes on to explore even more aspects of the predator homeworld based on the biology of the animals themselves, and it's all fascinating, and I love it, and it's exactly what I would have done. And so that's just my assessment of the predator homeworld. Uh, I really just want to be a super nerd. Well, guess what? You are one, James Green, super nerd. Aha! DG? It's been a long time since I shredded. Hey, but of course, I'm not always right. I just learned how to spell camouflage correctly, and only because I did this episode. I've been spelling it wrong my entire life. So what did I get wrong in the last episode? All right, the first correction is the biggest one, and it comes from a lot of people who all say the same thing, who all say the predator does not see an infrared. It is a technological advancement that their mask has. They are not seeing it with their own biology. Most of the comments were about this. Most of the corrections were about this. So, I mean, how could I possibly refute uh, so many people that are all saying the same thing? I don't know, let me read the direct quotes from the writers and directors of Predator 1 and Predator 2 from the DVD commentary. Hmm. Their vision operates mainly in the infrared portion of the electromagnetic spectrum. They can easily detect heat deferentials in their surroundings, but are unable to easily distinguish among objects of the same relative temperature. A predator's biomass increases its ability to see in a variety of spectra, ranging from the low infrared to the high ultraviolet, and also filters the ambient heat from the area, allowing them to see things with greater clarity and detail. Huh. Their vision operates mainly in the infrared portion. Do you think that I just say things? So predator masks do help with their vision and help them to see in other spectra, but canonically, they do primarily see, biologically speaking, in infrared, as we went through in the episode. It's almost like I looked it up. Saved you a comment. You're welcome. Our next correction is also from a lot of people and kind of builds on this point. At the very end of the episode, I said that a jungle environment would be one of the worst environments to use infrared vision in because of the ambient heat. It's very close to human body temperature and there's a lot of water vapor in the air which absorbs IR radiation, so it would be a terrible place to use thermal imaging. But as you all pointed out, and the directors and the writers, the biomass of the predator helps filter out kind of like frequency gating like, uh, like the uh, spider senses do for Peter Parker, so he's not overwhelmed. It, selectively uh, hones in on the frequencies of light that the predator would be interested in and filters out some of the rest so it wouldn't see nothing at all. And that's kind of what you see happen in the first Predator film when the predator takes off the mask and sees just a overlay of red. It's kind of exactly what we were talking about. So my point was that if it didn't have the mask, then a jungle environment would be terrible for a hunting predator. But if it did, as you all pointed out, it'd be fine if it has that technology. Fine, good, yes, I agree. Our next correction is kind of a technical one. I said in the episode that no animal, as far as we know, sees in infrared light like the predator does. But Ross Betts says some forms of fish, such as goldfish, salmon, piranha, and chiclid, chiclid, sorry, <laughs> can see in infrared light, and some goldfish and some bullfrogs can all do the same. Well, that would make me very incorrect in my statement. And, Ross, I know the website that you copy and pasted your entire comment from. It's right here. But I don't think that this is accurate. You will find a lot of websites that will say that some animals can see in infrared, but we can be more accurate than that. And when we are, it's not quite the same thing we're talking about that the predator does. So let's be clear on what we mean. If we are trying to see infrared light, like the heat from a human body, you have to see somewhere in the range of 10,000 nanometers, 10 micrometers. That's the black body radiation that a human puts out, and that's what you would want to look for and with a thermal imaging camera if you're looking for people, or if you're a predator with a biomask or without a biomask, that's the range you'd want to be in. Now, according to this study, it's in the show notes of the original episode, I had it there, the peak absorption wavelength 
the, the one that is the longest, the one that is the closest to infrared light that we have ever found in animals like salmon, like bullfrogs, exactly what you're talking about, Ross, well, not you, the website that you copied from, is 620 nanometers. Now look at the electromagnetic spectrum here. If you can only see up to 600 nanometer long wavelengths and you have to see 10,000 nanometer long wavelengths, look how far away you are from true infrared vision. In fact, what you are actually seeing is near infrared, which is more like red shifted visible light. So these animals that you claim can see in infrared like heat vision, it's not quite the same thing. It is a little bit further away from red light, but it is not true heat vision in the way that the predator portrays it. So even though you can find many websites claiming otherwise, if you are more specific, all of these examples of animals seeing in infrared are seeing in near infrared, not true thermal heat vision like the predator seems to have. And the study that I mentioned is even talking about the very same enzymes that you, Ross, and the website are talking about. Don't believe everything you read on the internet. Sometimes it's lacking context, sometimes it's not as specific as it could be, and sometimes it's flat out wrong. So do your own research too. It helps. Our next correction comes from the Christmas Ninja 12, who says, Kyle, love your hair. I don't know what you mean, thank you. Uh, who says, I don't think that an atmospheric chemical reaction can be what causes the predator's blood to glow outside of the body. The purpose of blood is to react with oxygen and carry it throughout the body. So if the predator's blood glows when oxidized, it would cause their skin to have a faint glow. And when they open up their mandibles, you'd probably, it would probably look like they swallowed a flashlight due to the high density of capillaries in the throat and lungs. Now, I think you're right. If the blood glowed all the time, that would be absolutely awesome and a, and a really interesting little character trait for the predators to have, to have the glowing blood underneath their skin and to see it. It'd be really, really cool. But I caution you, there's a difference between something carrying oxygen or being oxygenated and something being oxidized. Your blood is oxygenated. It is carrying oxygen to other parts of the body to be used. When something is oxidized, the oxygen is reacting with that thing and removing moving electrons from it. This is what so-called free radicals like oxygen do in your body. They react with molecules and they rip electrons off of atoms and molecules and such, and that can cause a lot of damage to your body, and that can cause chemical reactions to happen. That's what oxidizing is. So oxygenation is different from being oxidized. If you have a chemiluminescent reaction that needs to be oxidized, it can still be different from oxygenated blood. So I don't know if predator blood would glow still inside of its body, but if it did, I think you are right and that would be an awesome thing to include. But the best correction at the time I'm filming this episode, I got to give to Jack Lind or Lindy, who says, Kyle, or because science, it's fine, we're the same thing. Uh, didn't the first two Predator movies establish that the Predators only come to Earth to hunt during the hottest times of the year? Doesn't that indicate that the Predators may be cold-blooded and also require heat to remain active? If so, their thermal vision would have to evolve to see in a very bright thermal environment. If this is true, they wouldn't necessarily need to wait to a cooler part of the day or the night that boas and some vipers do when using thermals to hunt. Also, as for the mud question, I said, wouldn't the mud just heat up very quickly if you paste it over your skin? Uh, Jack says, I guess that would depend on how much clay is in the mud. If memory serves me correctly, the mud in the movie was gray in color, the same stupid color of the ground in Arkansas when you scratch the top of the soil off. So that could have a lot of clay in the soil. So Jack, your super nerd correction actually references the super nerd comment that we just had, where if you work backwards, you'd expect the home world to be very, very cold so the predators could see with their thermal vision very well. But if you look canonically, the Yaucha homeworld, Yaucha Prime, is a world filled with deserts, volcanoes, and jungles. Super, super hot environment. So that doesn't make sense. But as Jack says, if they evolved in that environment, evolved to be extremely sensitive, then they would come to the Earth in the hottest times of the year to the hottest places because that's where their evolved senses would work best. And you know about that stupid clay in Arkansas. And for that, Jack, you are indeed a super nerd. <laughs> ah!
Now, if you are already subscribed to Alpha, which you can do at projectalpha.com, you know what the next episode of Because Science is going to be because you saw it two days earlier than everyone else, and you got to see other premium content from Nerdist and Geek and Sundry, and you got a discount on new Because Science merch. <gasps> Lucky you. But if you haven't subscribed to Alpha just yet, the next episode of Because Science is Can Master Chief Really Survive a Fall from Space? That's right, in this week's episode of Because Science, I'm finally getting around to a question that I have been asked since I started this show, which is, in the seminal first-person shooter Halo 3, could Master Chief really fall out of the sky, as he does in the opening scenes, and impact the ground in a fireball and survive? I know he's a super soldier with armor, but can any humanoid survive an impact like that? We find out. Kind of. So go watch the latest episode of Because Science. If you haven't yet, leave all your comments, questions, and corrections at youtube.com slash because science, facebook.com slash because science, and at because science on Instagram and Twitter. That's where I'm checking and taking all the content for this show footnotes. Also, there's a subreddit. Search my name. And don't forget, biology is amazing. If you took all the veins out of a blue whale and laid them end to end, you would kill that whale, you monster.